No. Uh, I could take you to four of their ICUs now. I've got people like that all over Northern California. And, and uh, we don't have time. We're running out of time. Uh, but, you know, when you go there around, you meet the doctors. It takes time. You've got to talk to nurses. You have life right now. You're not in a hurry when you're around. Even if you are in a hurry, you don't act in a hurry. Because that makes everybody anxious if you start doing that. So I thought, thinking, see, that we really are intervening and helping in the care of those patients. They wouldn't be there without this robotic telemedicine. An H1N1 patient would be here or San Francisco. The gal with the aortic stenosis would be Memorial or here or San Francisco. The, um, the occupancy of that unit when we went there in 2007 was one. It's now two to four. Um, the hospital income went up when we went there from uh, 800 to from 80 million to 100 million, 20 million in one year when we started there. Uh, we went up in terms of ICU beds 135%. I'm going to show you the data here in a minute, but we have made an economic impact in this hospital because they can now take care of patients who have a higher acuity. They can keep them there, and they can keep them there fine. They're just as well there as if I was rounding on them here. I and mean, if I was rounding here, I'd be doing the same thing. And if they need to be intubated, we intubated them. We take care of them. We never, they never could do that before. They didn't have the confidence. They didn't have the um, technical ability. Um, so. By going to a small hospital with this technology and working with the nurse practitioners, Ann's a nurse practitioner, and Bruce Andish, the doctor I talked there, he's an internist. Smart guy, he's reading the new journal, telling me what he's reading about this new Pamavir, the new medication that's now printable. I didn't know that Mark telling me in the audience. It just came out Friday. Um, uh, it, it works. Now, again, I could take you to uh, mention the coach runner. I've got two people there. I've got an alcoholic who came in, who's in DTs, and he was also in pulmonary edema uh, and has an aspiration pneumonia. I'll show you another patient who came in up there. He was intubated, by the way. We extubated him yesterday. Another patient up there came in with a narcotic overdose. This is a funny, this is a story. He had a hip replaced at UCSF. They sent him home. He self-catheterized himself because he has a neurogenic bladder. They gave him opiates. He got sluggish on the opiates, and he stopped catheterizing himself, so he came in with a with uh, obstructive renal field, <coughs> with a creatinine of 6 and a, a potassium of 7.7. .7. You think we can keep a person like that in the Mendocino Coast? Sure we can. What we did is put a Foley in him. He died reached a liter an hour. And the potassium came right down. In six hours, it was 4.5. And we could keep the patient there. We didn't need to call a frantic nef nephrologist here and send that patient down by helicopter. We could take care of the patient in Mendocino Coast. So we've got two people in Mendocino Coast, two people in Willits. In uh, Ukiah Valley, I was going to take you there. I've got a young lady who's intubated with H1N1 pneumonia. She's a heavy lady. It's, it's much more severe in heavy ladies and in, in, in pregnant people. Um, pregnant, per, pregnant ladies. Ladies. Um, <laughs> not people. Uh, and uh, she's on a ventilator and doing very badly. She, this is her 10th uh, her day on a ventilator. We can't get her off. Very bad pneumonia. It's, she has bad respiratory failure. She's respirator dependent, very encephalopathic. She also has hep C. She also has cirrhosis. She also is an alcoholic. You see the problems that come along. But we're taking care of right there. Uh, at uh, Palm Drive, I have two patients. I have a lady who came in with, um, actually she presented in Fort Bragg with GI bleeding. And they called me because they have no endoscopist. With GI bleeding, you have to have an endoscopist. That's part of what you have to have. And this guy's a heavy drinker. So she came down to us from Fort Bragg. They couldn't keep her in the Her crib was 15. Even go in five. We gave her four units, sent her down, I had her scope. She doesn't have varices, she has gastritis. She's drinking uh, a quart and a half of vodka a day. And uh, she's fine right now. We can see her right now. Yes? Can I ask what do you do with people who need central lines, thoracic pieces? Uh, sure. I'll give you an example. The person uh, that I admitted uh, with the uh, renal failure, we need to have a central line to know the CVP to give uh, fluid. Jeff Pierce was the hospitalist who just graduated from here. Jeff put a central line in for me. Had a patient uh, with a pneumothorax in uh, Willis the other day. I called the, the surgeon whose office is right by the hospital. I said, I'll go right over and put it in. Had a patient the other night, um, actually yesterday morning, in uh, Mendocino Coast, needed to be intubated, and I, the ER doctor did it. They're, they're, the skill is in the hospital, and I rely upon the ER doctor and the surgical staff and the hospitalist. I can get almost anything done anywhere. And uh, I don't have to round doing procedures like I used to do in the past. 
I'd be spending all my day doing procedures in the past. I don't do that now. I'm more cognitive medicine. Okay? Um, so uh, just that's a rundown of the hospitals. And now you can see we just made working rounds. This isn't fluff. This is really caring for people. And it's getting my expertise to them because I have more expertise than they do. Um, you know, for a consultation to work, you have to have knowledge they don't have. It has to be a waterfall phenomenon. You're helping them care for the patient. If that doesn't exist, they won't ask you to see a patient. Uh, when I finish these rounds, I've got to see another patient in um, uh, Ukiah who came in, a young fellow, been out in the field, he came in, he has a, he's a, he's a bilateral diffusion pneumonia. They don't know what it is, and he's on a ventilator. They just don't know what it is. So it's a good case for me. I'll come in and maybe it's Babesia, maybe it's Ehrlichia. You see the stuff I see? You don't see that normally. That's my bread and butter. But I can come in and really have maybe um, uh, Psittacosis, um, which you had one time. <laughs> uh, uh, and, you, know, it, it, you don't know what it is. But, but see, this is, you call a special, that's what I do. Tough pneumonia, that's my bread and butter. You know? Anyway, um, I can take you to other hospitals but I'm not going to right now. I'm going to give a little, little didactic session right now to finish up here. And that's talking about uh, uh, really what we are doing right now. Now, we actually have a school of telemedicine. It's the first in the country. And we're ha having our third session this January, January 11th to 12th, 13th. And the residents are, are welcome free. And anybody else is welcome in addition. Uh, it, it's a school, the purpose of which is to educate physicians in terms of how to use telemedicine to help their rural hospital. These are for rural physicians. These are the dates. It's $300 a person, but I'll waive it for house staff. Um, and the participants, you see I'm the director of the thing. These are the, this is the first morning. I'm going to talk. Bernstein talks about strokes. Uh, Roy Berman talks about pediatric critical care. Shelley Gordon talks about infectious diseases. These are all offered by the Rupa. And this, and then we, in the afternoon, we show how to operate the equipment. <coughs> Next day, we talk about um, using a medical record. Now, we have developed our own electronic medical record. It's not that hard. All you do is go to Microsoft and get their modules. You put the modules together, and you have an electronic medical record. We've created our own electronic medical record. I have a guy I found who is sort of like the Samuel Johnson of dictionaries. He's the one man who can do a medical record. His name is Dick Smith, and he's the New York Times informatics guy for the West Coast. And he did our medical record. He did it by modular construction. And it's the, all the latest stuff. And we'll, you, we'll give any rural hospital this medical record to use free so that we can use our robot there and have a medical record to see patients. You can't beat that, you can. Um, Free for six months, and then we're going to get a charge. We don't know what the charge will be. Um, but um, that, that, he's going to talk about our medical record. We're trying to. In fact, yesterday I was talking to a friend in Nebraska about trying to use our medical record. They've got a hospital there, 14 beds. That's just the place we want to be. A little place to start. Um, this is the. Uh, and Joe Clinton in the audience. He's going to talk about sniffs. Why sniffs? The Palm Drive Hospital right now. Our hospital by a modified Skype system, it's going to take care of three sniffs around it by our hospital staff. So patients don't have to come to the emergency room. We can evaluate them there and decide whether they have to be admitted or not and stop these uh, expensive ER visits of people with sniffs, which 60 of the time they go back to the sniff when they come to the ER, a great cost. We're trying to eliminate that. By just, we have our own Skype system. For $10,000 uh, and an Adobe platform, we built our own Skype system. It's our own secure system. You have to go to our website to do it. You have to double encrypt to get into it. And it costs nothing once you get it made. It's, it's not, not the same as the Skype I use. It's our own Skype. It's all the technology there. You can do it. But it costs money. Our voice is as good, but our pictures is good. Okay? And it's our secure. We're not on the open internet. You have to go to, to our site to use it, if you will. 